Last time we extended our language to J2 and the CK1 machine. And J2, the thing that was defining about it is that it had functions. And in particular, the kinds of functions it has are functions like um, Pascal or Pascal or C or even Java. Not exactly like Java because Java also has classes and objects and maybe that's a little bit more complicated, but in some ways the, um, the set of functions available to a Java program uh, are like Pascal and C. And the thing that was defining about CK1 is that we had this global mapping, global mapping of function names, function names to their definitions. Now, <clears throat> the key rule for the CK1 machine was this rule right here where we say that once we've reached the final value and we have an application that has some sequence of arguments followed by the function name, no more arguments, and then a continuation, then we reduce this to the E body prime NK, where E body prime is got from substituting the various arguments E0 or X0 through Xn with V0 through Vn into the normal body, where if we look up the function inside of big delta, then we get its definition. Now, <clears throat> notice that the CK machine didn't have any rule for variables. There was no rule that said, if you had a variable and a K, then you should do something. Such a rule didn't exist because variables all go away. Variables are removed by subst. All right. <clears throat> now, here's an unfortunate thing about this definition right here. It has reintroduced a linear step in our evaluation. What is linear about it? The thing that's linear about it is, is that the substitution function right here has to walk across the entire expression e body, which means that if that expression had, let's say, a thousand uh, nodes in it, it would have to look at all 1,000 of them to find all the different places where the variable might have been mentioned. This is unfortunate because it means that now we're inefficient. Ah, uh, frustrating. Okay, so we have to change this because our, one of our principles for designing our machines is that we always want to have constant steps. So we have to have some other technique. And unfortunately, there's no little tweak that we can do. We have to have a new kind of machine. So this new kind of machine is called the CEK machine. The CEK machine. The C stands for the code. The K stands for the continuation. Continuation. And then E stands for the environment. All right. And its state is as follows. We have an expression. That's the code. We have an environment. I'll talk about what that is in a moment. And a continuation. Environments are either empty or they're an environment with an extension mapping one variable to one value. And continuations are the same as before. We have kret, we have kif, eek, and we have kapp. V arrow, e arrow, k. All right. Now, the crucial rule that's special is the following rule. We're going to add a rule for what to do if you get a variable. If you get a variable x and you have some environment and some continuation, 
then what you do is you look up in the environment the variable x. And that's all. Okay, and so this lookup function, it does what you'd think. It walks down this linked list and it finds the x that matches and returns the variable. So all the other rules are fairly straightforward. If you have an if with an ec, et, and ef, environment, and k, then what you do is you go to ec with the same environment, the k if, et, ef, and k. If you get to a false with some environment, and there is a uh, k if of et, ef, and k, then you focus on the ef, the environment, and the k is popped off. If you have another kind of value, then we're going to focus on et, right? Now we have to have the ones for functions. So if we have a function call where there's en, sorry, e0, and then some more arguments, some environment, and some continuation, then we focus on that first argument, and we have the application, no argument, uh, no variables, sorry, no values, then the other arguments, and then k. If we reduce that to an argument, sorry, to a variable, we have the environment, the k app, we have some earlier arguments, we have some more um, expressions, and k, okay, then what we do is we're going to turn this into E0, where we have the environment. I'm going to stop writing these backwards, by the way. You just know that you can make them, you can store them backwards, and that's more efficient. EM dot 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 K. Then, if you have finished this, and we have an application of a primitive, v0 dot dot dot, no more expressions, and a k, then we reduce this to delta of p v0 dot 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 vn environment k. So this is a primitive call. Now there's one more rule, which is the rule for when it's a function. So here we have a k app, and we have f v0 dot dot dot, no more, k. Okay. Here what's going to happen is that we're going to go directly to look at e body. We're not going to look at e body prime anymore because we're no longer going to have substitution. We're done with substitution. But we, what we are going to do is we're going to extend the environment. We're going to take the environment and we're going to add things to it. We're going to make it so that x0 goes to v0, x1 goes to v1, up to xn going to vn, and then we have k, where define f of x0 through xn is equal, sorry, uh, e body is equal to delta of f. All right, so this right here is the CEK machine. Let's look at um, let's look at how it evaluates. So suppose that we have our example program where we have define double x is x plus x, 
and we're going to call it on double one. Okay, so we're going to start off with double one. The environment is empty and the continuation is k rent. We focus on double. We leave the environment alone and our app and our continuation says k app with nothing here, a one and the k rent. We then see that that's a value. Focus on the one. Have k app here. Have double in there. No more arguments. Then we see that the functions happened. So now we focus on the now we focus on the body, which is plus xx. And then we take the empty environment and we extend it with a mapping from x to the argument one. And then we have the continuation bk red. Now we focus on the plus. The environment still says that. We have an application with no variables yet, and then we have xx, kret. Next we have the first argument, x, with the environment, so that, this is a plus, that's an x, kret. Now we look that up and we get a 1. Then we see that one is a value and we look at the next x. Plus one, nothing more there. <sighs> we see that that's a one. K app plus one, no more arguments, K rent. Now we see that that's a value, this is a primitive, so we can reduce that to 2. And, oops. Now we're done, and we see that the answer is 2. Okay? So notice that we didn't have to do any linear steps, except kind of we do, where we have to do a linear step right here when we look up the variable's value. That is linear in the number of variables, but we can actually make that efficient by not having this be a linked list, have it be some sort of um, data structure like a hash table, and then it would be uh, log n if it were stored as a tree, or o1 if it was stored as a different kind of hash table. So it's totally fine. All right. This is the CEK machine, and it's more efficient, except that I made a giant mistake. These rules are totally wrong. I'm going to write a big thing right here that says wrong. And the reason why these rules are totally wrong is that they have changed the meaning of our programs. Let's look at an example to see why our programs are now suddenly different. And we'll compare running the program with the two different versions. All right, so let's write a function define f that takes one argument x and it returns y. Then there's a function called g and it takes an argument named y and what it does is it calls the function f with 0. Then we are going to call g with 1. This program should return an error. The reason it should return an error is because, and if you run this in your big step interpreter, it will return an error, it's because g of 1 is equal to f of 0, f of 0 is equal to y, and y is unbound. So this program doesn't make any sense. So if you run in our big step interpreter, it'll give an error. If you run in the ck machine, the ck1 machine, it will also give an error, because it will see that y and it will have a mistake. But, unfortunately, it will not get an error in our new CEK machine. Let's watch what happens. We have G1 in an empty environment in KRET. I'm going to make things go a little fast. 
We then take a few steps and we get one, nothing, and then we have k app of g, no arguments, k ret. Then now we're going to look at the body, so we're going to have f0, and we're going to have an environment that says that y goes to 1, then we're going to have k ret. Then what's going to happen is that we're going to evaluate for a little bit. And we're going to have y going to 1. Then we're going to have k app of f going to k ret. All right. Now we're going to look inside of that f, and we're going to look at its body, which is y. And then our environment is going to say that y is 1 and x is 0. And you can see what the problem is. Now we have k ret. And then, of course, we're going to look up the value of that y, and we're going to get 1. And this is going to stay the same, and then we'll have k ret. OK, and then it's going to say that the answer is 1. So this is clearly a problem. So how can we fix it? How can we fix this rule, these rules? Well, one thing that you might think that we could do is we could look right here. And in this case right here, we could change that environment to empty. We could change this right here to empty. OK? So we change that to empty, then now everything will work correctly. Good job. The idea is that when we go call a new function, what we need to do is make sure that the old function, its variables are no longer allowed to be referenced. So what that means is, is that when we get to this point, we wouldn't go here. We would go to a new path where we would get the body, which is y, and then we would have empty x going to 0. Okay, right. And then at that point, we would look it up and we would get an error. So we'd get an error. Okay? And that would be correct. Now it's right. Unless empty. Okay? So what I did is I just put a little star right there and it says, unless that's empty, then it's wrong. Okay. So by making it so that that spot right there is empty, when I say empty, I mean the empty set. Okay. Now we fix this. Languages that have the erroneous rule have been tried in the past. So there are some languages where the people designed them thinking that this program was an error. Then they implemented them, and they made this mistake. And then they went back and said, mm, maybe I want that. The most famous example of this is a language that's called Emacs Lisp. So you may know that Emacs is a uh, text editor, but in addition to being a text editor, it is its own programming language implementation, and that implementation is called Emacs Lisp. And it's a language that's similar to normal Lisp, but it has this feature. And we call this feature dynamic scope. Dynamic scope means that the value of a variable comes not from the static position that it occurs in the program, but from the dynamic control context that allows it to get there. So what that means is that when you look at this program right here, you can't look at this y and figure out what value it has by looking at the program syntax. What you have to do is you have to simulate it running in your head and realize that it could be called from this position, and when it's called from that position, y has a, y has a variable. Sorry, y has a value. OK. It turns out, however, that our rules have other problems, too. And they have more subtle problems. So let's look at another example of a problem that we have. <clears throat> so suppose that we have. Um, so here's a program. Define f of x true if 
f of 0 x x. Now this program makes no sense, right? It makes no sense because these variables x are unbound. But we'll see that in our language, they actually, um, it does actually mean something. And here's, the, here's what happens. So we start off with if f0 xx, the null environment in kret, then we focus on the f0. We have an empty thing here. We have k if. And then inside we have x, x, and k ret. Then we take a few steps and we see 0, empty, k app, f, nothing here. Then we have k if, x, x, k ret. Then, at this point, we go look at the body, which says true, and then the environment says empty, because we forget about that one, and we say that x goes to zero. Then we have k if x x k ret. Then because that's a true, we choose the true branch, so then we focus on the x there. And if we go look at the rule that I wrote down, See that when you have a true, the environment is preserved. Okay. So that means that we now go into this environment right here, where x is bound. And then, of course, we look it up and we return 0. And that means that now the program returns 0. But it should return error. And so we're wrong again. So it turns out that this CEK machine is actually wrong even more. It's just wrong. There's all sorts of problems with it. Overall, the main way to understand what is wrong with it is, is that substitution happens on the program source code. And the program source code means that we need to make sure that by the time we get to a component of the program, we remember all of the substitutions that would have happened on it had we got there. And this right here is a problem because we're going to remember ET and EF for later, but we're going to remember it in such a way that we don't keep track of what substitutions should have happened. So here's the correct version of the CEK machine. 6, 6. So the correct. CEK. And I'm not going to I'm not going to trick you. I'm not going to put any any mistakes in it. All right. So our states are going to be e environment and k. Environments are going to be empty or an environment extended with a mapping from x to a value. And k's are going to be more complicated. We're going to have a k ret like before we're going to have a k if, which is going to have the environment that was around when it was made, and then the two e's. And then we're going to have a k app, and it's going to have a sequence of values, the environment that was around, and a sequence of expressions, and then the k. And that's the crucial thing that's going to be different. We're going to have to remember what these environments are. Okay, so now let's write down the rules. So if we have an x and an environment and some k, then we're going to go to looking up in the environment that x. And then at this point, the environment is no longer needed, so we're going to turn it into null. If we have an if with an e, c, e, t, e, f, an environment and k. Then we're going to focus on et, leave the environment alone here, construct a k if that remembers the old environment, has et, ef, and k. If we get to a false, 
we're going to ignore the environment. We're just going to totally ignore it because it's not useful to us. And then if there's a kif that has a saved environment, an et, an ef, and a k, then we're going to go to ef, the saved environment. Let's put a little prime on it to make sure we remember that it's special. And then we're going to pop off that frame. If instead we got a different value, we're still going to ignore that. We have kf, the saved environment, et, ef, and k. Then we're going to go to et, the saved environment, and k. All right. If we have an application, then we're going to focus on the first thing, leave the environment alone, construct a K app that has no values yet. We're going to save the environment for later. We're going to save the other arguments and the continuation. If we turn that into a value, V1, there's some environment which we're going to totally ignore. Then there's a K app that has some sequence of values, a saved environment, and then some sequence of expressions. Then what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the next one, restore the saved environment that we save for later, have the application, save the value, leave the environment alone, and then save those. Now just as an aside, there's one little uh, performance tweak that we could do. If EM right here happened to be empty, then we could put empty right here and uh, you know deallocate it right away. All right. Whew. Last, we have two more rules, that if we have the last value and we have a K app of some primitive applied to some values, and we're going to ignore this environment as well. There's no more arguments here, and there's a K. Then what we'll do, and what we'll do is we'll go to delta P V0 dot 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 VN. We'll have the empty environment here, and we'll have K. And if instead it was a function call, If instead it was a function call, then in that case, we're going to look at the body, which I'll write as EB. We're going to have a new environment that starts off empty, that maps x0 to v0 up to xn to vn, and then we'll have k here, where looking up f gives us define f of x0 through xn eb. All right, so this right here is the correct version of the CEK machine. It does not have dynamic scope because we correctly store all the old versions um, of the environments as we go. Now one more thing about dynamic scope, although I said that mainly weird languages like Emacs Lips has this, in fact it turns out that many other languages have it too. In particular, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, Perl, PHP, and so on, they have a few specific variables that are dynamic scope. So if we just take JavaScript as an example, the this variable is dynamically scoped. Um, and that is... Uh, you know, there are a few times when you can uh, accidentally discover this. If you accidentally write a function call on a method, not with method call syntax, but with function call syntax. All right. Just looking at my notes about what we want to do next. Okay. 
Um, at this point, uh, in your big step interpreter, um, we're never going to maintain the big step interpreter anymore because it's kind of a pain to deal with. So if you are following at home in your program, then at this point you should delete your big step interpreter. We're not going to need it anymore. What we're going to do now is we're going to extend our programming language yet again to go from J2 to J3. We're going to extend our language in the following way. We're going to move beyond C and Pascal and have functions that are more like JavaScript. Functions like JavaScript. And when I say like JavaScript, I don't mean with that weird dynamic uh, scope thing that I just was talking about. Instead, what I mean is, is that we're inside of JavaScript and languages like Python and Racket and Ruby uh, and modern versions of C++ and um, Java, you have Lambda functions, so so-called Lambda functions. What are Lambda functions? Well, what Lambda functions are, are anonymous functions, i.e. functions that don't have a name that are locally scoped. Locally scoped. I could give you examples about how they work in these other languages, but I think that it would be more clear to just write down what our syntax for them is uh, and how they work. So actually, let me just write down, like in JavaScript, to write down a lambda, you might write down something like x arrow 1 plus x. And what that means is that there's a function that takes one argument, x, and it will return 1 plus x. We could write this in Python by writing lambda, lambda, with a colon, and then x, I think, uh, and then we would have 1 plus x inside. Actually, I'm not really a, a Python programmer, so I don't really know what this index is. But I know in C++, what it is, is you would put brackets, and then you would write int x, and then inside we would write return 1 plus x. So all these are expressions, and they are an expression that has, uh, that is a function. It's a new kind of value that's a function. All right, so that's what we're going to add to our language. So here's the syntax, here's the definition of our J3 language. We have E's like before, and they have values, they have function calls, function calls, they have ifs, and they have variables. Functions now have two different kinds of things. Constants, just like before, right, and constants are numbers and bools and primitives, okay? but no special function names. Function names are not special here. But there's one other new kind of value, and that is the lambda. And so we write it as lambda with x dot dot dot, so that means one or more, or zero or more variables, and then one body expression. This is a new kind of value. Our evaluation contexts are still the same as they were before. You can have a whole, you can have an if, E, 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 and you can have a sequence of values, an E, and a sequence of E's. Now the rule for the big step, sorry, the, uh, the small step rule for this is that if we have an evaluation context, we're inside, there's a call to a lambda that has n arguments and some body, and it's been called with n variables, sorry, n values, then this is equal to going into this body expression right here and then finding all the variables and substituting them. So calling subs on each one. Okay. So let's look at an example program in our language. So imagine we had Lambda x, and it's going to be called, it's going to call lambda y, 
And then inside of this, it's going to say x plus y. Okay, and we're going to call that with 7. And we're going to call that with 8. Okay. So what happens is this 7 right here goes into that y and then pops out there. This 8 goes into that x and then pops out there. And that means that the whole thing is equal to 8 plus 7, which is, of course, equal to 15. All right. Now, there's a common abbreviation that we're going to use over and over and over again that you're going to put inside of your desugarer. And your desugarer is going to have this rule. It's going to say that if you write let of x equals e1 in e2, then it's going to turn that into lambda x e1 applied to e2. Oh yeah, sometimes we write, sometimes rather than put in parentheses here, we'll just list the variables out and then put a dot. So this means lambda, this is the same thing as writing lambda x e1 e2. Okay, so they're the same thing. Okay, so these let expressions are really uh, common. Okay, and so this program right here, this example program that I wrote, is the same as if I had wrote let x equals 8 in let y equals 7 in x plus y. Okay, so basically what lets do is they allow us to have functions, sorry, what lambdas do is they allow us to have functions without names, and lets are a quick abbreviation for a function call that just establishes a name. Now one thing that's important to note is that um, is that uh, lets, uh, lets like this, a sequence of lets, um, allow you to like use the same name over and over again. So we could do like let x equals like 8 in let x equals x plus 1 in x plus x. So these x's are this one, and this x is that one. Okay, So this whole thing would be 9 plus 9, or 18. Now sometimes... Uh, you can we we might want to make it so our let rule looks like this. Where we'll say that let of x zero e zero dot 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 x n e n in e b would be equal to a lambda where we have x zero through x n e b. And then this would all be applied to E0 through EN. And so this allows us to have simultaneous assignment of names, which can be convenient. There's another desugaring rule that you might like, which is called let star. And let star looks like this. Let star of nothing in EB is just equal to EB. But let star of one thing, x0, E0, with then some more stuff, x, m, e, m, dot, 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 in e, b, it is equal to let x, zero, e, zero, in let star x, m, e, m, dot, 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 in e, b. Let star essentially allows you to have a sequence of definitions where each one can refer to the previous one. All right. The next thing that's uh, useful to sort of notice as a consequence of um, uh, as a consequence of lambdas is that lambdas lambdas they save their previous values. So here's, here's a little example program. We could write the program let f be equal to let x equals 1 in lambda y 
x plus y in f of 3. So what happens in this program? Well, in this program, this x is substituted to right there. So that means that f it is as if we wrote let f equals lambda y 1 plus y in f of 3. Therefore, it's as if we wrote 1 plus 3 or 4. Okay, So lambdas, any variable that was around when they were defined, has been substituted inside of them so they remember it. This is really common. This is commonly why people like lambdas in normal programming languages, uh, because they save the values of previous variables, which is very convenient. All right. So, how can we um, adapt our CEK machine to uh, deal with uh, lambdas? Here's what we do. And we'll call this uh, CEK1. And I'm not going to I'm not going to trick you. We're going to write the the actual one. So normally with our CEK machine, like with CEK0, the values were just the constants, okay, the same things as before. But in our new language, values are constants and lambdas. Okay, that's in our new language, J3 and J3. So it used to be that in CEK0, the values in the CK machine agreed with the values in the language. But J3 has these, and CK1 is going to have a different set of values. Its values are going to be B and a new type. This new type is going to be called a closure. And a closure is going to store inside of it a lambda and the environment that was around at the time that it was defined. That's because the CEK machine saves all substitutions for the future. So that means that we're going to have to look at a function, at, a, at some code like this, where let x equals 1, and we're going to have to remember what variables were around at the time. And since we're going to have to remember what variables were around at the time, we're going to have to keep track of the fact that x should have been 1. And so that's what this is going to be for. All right. So we're going to have the following rules. We're going to say that if we ever get to a lambda, and there's some environment, and there's some continuation, then what you're going to return is a closure with that same lambda. And we're going to save the environment for later. And we're going to have null there, nk. Then in the future, if we ever actually call this thing, we're going to have the last argument. We're going to ignore this environment. We're going to have a k app where the first thing inside of there is going to be a closure with a lambda that has x0 through xn, and then some body, eb, and then it has some saved environment, which I'll write as environment prime. Then there's going to be the actual arguments, v0 dot dot dot. Then there's going to be a saved environment, which we don't care about. Then there's going to be no more arguments, and then there's going to be k. And in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the body, eb. We're going to take the saved environment, environment prime, not empty. Environment prime is the one that has all the substitutions that were around before when we called it. And we're going to <coughs> um, include x0 goes to v0 up to xn goes to vn, and then the original k. All right. So let's look at an example program. and see how it runs. 
So here's the example program that we're going to do. We're going to do the program from before, the one that saves f. So we're going to say that let f equal let x equals 1 in lambda y x plus y in f of 3. So that's going to be our example program. Now there's going to be a lot of typing here, so what I'm going to do for simplicity is I'm going to label these. Let's label this program right here A, and let's label this one B, and let's label this piece C, and this part D. Okay, so we're going to start off and we're going to have program A. And the environment is going to be empty, and we're going to have KRET. Now the first thing that we have is a let, and we know that a let is really a function call. So that means that we're going to focus on B, the argument. The environment is going to be empty, and we're going to know that when we're done, we're going to call the body. So we're going to call a K app that has, let's call this part E down here, F3. We're going to call a closure with lambda f e and an empty environment. And we don't care what that is. And there's no other arguments because this is the last one. OK. So then we're going to look at b. And what's b? b is a let, and that let is going to cause us to record inside of the environment the binding for x. So we're going to get down to evaluating c, and the environment is going to say that x goes to 1. And we're going to have, um, that's c, x goes to 1, and then we're going to have this lambda right here, and um, and this continuation stays the same. Okay, but now that C is a lambda, so that means that we're going to return a closure that has the code for C and it has this environment right here where x is equal to 1. And then we're going to have an empty environment and then we're going to have the same continuation. Now that is going to get returned, this closure is going to get returned, and we're going to evaluate E. And our environment is going to say that F is equal to that closure right there, the closure that says that it goes to the code C and the saved environment X goes to 1. Close that, close that. And then we have a K ret. OK. So what is E? E is F applied to 3. So since it's F applied to 3, that means that we're going to get 3, okay, with an environment that we don't care about. Then we're going to have a K app where we're going to be calling this closure right here, the closure that has the code for C. We have lambda x goes to 1. Close that. So that closes this. There's no other arguments. Then we have an environment that we don't care about, no other arguments, and the KRET. All right. So what we're going to do then is we're going to open up this code, and we're going to look at the body D. We're going to have the saved environment that has x going to 1. And we're going to have the extension with y going to 3. And then we're going to have KRET. All right. And what is D but x plus y? So that means that we're going to get down to looking at x and then y. So we're going to have another 3 with an environment that we don't care about, a k app of plus 1 and then nothing, an environment we don't care about, nothing, and then KRET. And then that's going to reduce down to 4.
And that's going to be the final answer for. Okay. <clears throat> now, obviously I skipped a bunch of steps, um, but I hope that you can see the way that what these closures do is they allow us to record these values. Now I do want to comment a little bit about uh, the efficiency of closures. What I've described so far are what are called flat, sorry, uh, what are called nested closures. They're kinda, they're kinda nested closures. Um, hmm. Okay, so there are different implementation techniques for closures. So let's call them naive, flat, and nested. So what we just did is we did naive closures. And so a naive closure works like this. A closure has two fields. It has the lambda, the lambda, and it has the environment. And what the environment is, is the environment is a linked list that has an x, a value, and then another environment. And that points down to the next one. And so on until we get down to empty. So what that means is that looking up a variable requires you to look up in this environment and do a linear number of steps. This is kind of inefficient. So what often happens is that we'll take your program, and this would this would happen inside of your high level uh, your high level program, like your compiler. This is actually not uh, required. It's like one of the uh, extra credit things that you can do. We'd have a program like lambda x x plus one, and what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into the following. We're going to turn it into lambda with no name, and we're going to turn it into plus zero with a little hat on it. And what that little hat is is the static address. Now what do we mean by static address? What we mean by static address is the um, is basically which argument inside of the closure it refers to. And so we would turn this into zero and then maybe this into one and then imagine this was part of a larger program that said like let y equals three in let z equals 4 in that. Um, and so the idea here is, is that this closure right here only has two variables. And so we're going to call them 0 and 1. And then we're going to make it so that the closure is implemented like this. The closure has the lambda, like before. And then it also has a vector of values. So for instance, this one its lambda would be that, and its vector of values would be um, would be three. Uh, okay, so sorry, uh, it would have a blank spot to store the zero, the the argument, and then it would have a three. And this would be called a flat closure. There's another method that's the nested closures. And what those do is they make it so that their static addresses are a pair of numbers, two natural numbers. And they make it so that the way that their, vec that their vectors work, sorry, the way that their environments work, is that an environment has two things. It has a pointer to another environment, and then it has a vector of values. So the idea here is, is that this program might be compiled into something like, um, oh, sorry. Uh, it's not an. It's not really an environment. It's not really a pointer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So sorry. What this number means is it tells you how many environments to go back. How many environments to go back. And then this number tells you which in the vector. So the idea is, is that your closure has this thing for the environment, and basically what it's going to do is it's going to follow this linked list that many times, and then look at that vector. This basically makes it so that you are linear in the number of function calls rather than linear in the number of variables. Um, 
and you're kind of optimized for the case where you're looking at your own arguments rather than the saved ones. So it's very rare for real languages to use naive closures, like I've demonstrated. It's much more common for them to use flat or nested. Now you may think to yourself, like, when is one good versus the other? Why? I think most people, they look at this and they assume that flat is better. Flat generally is better for speed, but it's not better for space. And it's also not better for speed if functions are, if closures are created a lot, but then not actually called. Nested ones are faster to construct because you only have to store one vector for the most recent things. So there's a trade-off between these, and it's a common optimization uh, problem to look at um, to look at code and decide whether or not it should use a flat or a nested uh, closure in any particular function call. So this is kind of like extra stuff that you don't really need to know about, um, but hopefully you find it interesting. All right. So, um, that is all for today, and next time we will talk about something new.